Welcome to Biology Minds. Today we're going to talk about the nervous system. So as we move away from the skeletal system and the muscular system, we're going to start talking about the systems that really help us to uh, coordinate the things that we want to do, that, are, that we want our body to do. So we talk about the nervous system and we later on talk about the endocrine system. So with the nervous system, um, we start out by talking about just it on a, a, a cellular level, talk about the neural tissue. And the neural tissue consists of the neurons, which is the primary uh, cell that we talk about with the nervous system. That is what is going to drive the nervous system. That's the functional unit of the nervous system. And anything that's going to support the neurons, we call neuroglia or glial cells. Those are our supporting cells, our, our, uh, our pieces of the nervous system that are going to help protect the neurons as well. And organs of the nervous system, we talk about the brain and the spinal cord, which is our central nervous system. And then we have sensory receptors or sense organs like our eyes or ears and et cetera, or skin. And then you have nerves, which are going to connect the nervous system with other systems. When we talk about nervous system, there's different divisions. The two primary divisions that we talk about, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is going to uh, consist of that brain and the spinal cord. The functions uh, include the sensory data from inside and outside of the body, motor commands, as well as higher functions in the brain like uh, memory, learning, intelligence and even emotion. Peripheral nervous system is anything that is outside of that brain and the spinal cord. Uh, includes all the, that neural tissue that we talk about that is not within that central nervous system. And some functions include uh, they deliver the, the sensory information to the central nervous system and they carry the motor commands to that peripheral tissue outside of the uh, central nervous system. Nerves, also called peripheral nerves, those are the nerves that are outside of the central nervous system. It's bundles of axons. Axons are part of the neurons with connective tissues and blood vessels, and they carry that sensory information and motor commands in the peripheral nervous system. So we have two different types of nerves that we talk about, cranial nerves that are going to connect directly to the brain, and then spinal nerves that are going to attach to the spinal cord different uh, divisions of the peripheral nervous system. You have your afferent division, which is involves sensory information, and you have your efferent division, which includes motor commands. So I always tell students a good way to remember which ones go with which. We have the word same. All right, my pen is not cooperating. But SA, those are our sensory afferent and then we have me that is going to be our motor efferent division we have receptors and effectors of the afferent division our receptors are going to de detect changes or respond to the stimuli and then our effectors are going to respond to the efferent signals uh, the efferent di division then has uh, its own divisions. It has the somatic nervous system, which controls the voluntary and involuntary reflexes of the skeletal muscle contractions. And then you have the, your autonomic nervous system, which is going to be divided into your sympathetic division and your parasympathetic division. Your sympathetic is going to have a stimulating effect and your parasympathetic is going to have a relaxing effect. So this is just a, a diagram to show you how you have your two primary divisions of your nervous system, your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. And then you are going to have it broken, our peripheral nervous system broken down into our afferent and our efferent or our sensory and our motor. And then within that, we have our uh, motor or efferent div division broken up into our somatic nervous system and our autonomic nervous system. And then our autonomic nervous system is broken up into our parasympathetic and our sympathetic divisions. Neurons, basic function, functional unit of the nervous system. There are different types of neurons. We talk about multipolar neurons is uh, very common in the central nervous system. It has a cell body often called the soma, and then it has dendrites and axons. So just as a basic general idea of what a neuron is, you have to know that it, it has a cell body with dendrites coming off it, and then it has our our axons going off to our axon terminals. Within the cell body, you have a cytoplasm that we call our perikaryon. 
And there's mitochondria because we need them to produce energy. Remember the cellular energy that we always talk about is ATP. And then you have rough endoplasmic reticulum and ribosomes that are going to produce those neurotransmitters. Remember that ribosomes play a part in forming these proteins. And those proteins, when we talk about different types of proteins, specific some specific proteins uh, that we can talk about, one is neurotransmitters. So they are made in the cell body of the neuron um, within those ribosomes on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The cell body then has a cytoskeleton uh, with uh, neurofilaments and neurofibrils, has a nasal bodies, which are dense areas of rough endoplasmic reticulum and ribosomes where our neurotransmitters are going to be uh, produced and they make the neural tissue appear gray. So the, that dense area of rough endoplasmic reticulum with the ribosomes is going to make that gray matter that we talk about later on um, uh, in the chapter or in the unit about nervous system. We talk about white matter versus gray matter. Well, that gray matter is, is gray because of this dense area of of rough endoplasmic reticulum that we call the nasal bodies. Dendrites are highly branched. They are going to receive information uh, from other neurons and 80 to 90% of the neuron surface area is made up of these dendrites. And then you have a long axon, which is going to carry electrical signals or an action potential to the target. And, um, you know, we always talk about sending signals, or right? it's literally an electrical signal that is gonna be sent down, receiving messages from the dendrite, sending that signal down the axon so that it could then go to either the next neuron or it can go to uh, a gland or a muscle. We talked about the neuromuscular junction previously. Well, this is where we talk about the nervous system side of it more and less the muscular system side of it. So before we talked about how it's going to cause that change in the, that muscle cell, we're talking more about, all right, what is coming down that is causing that change in that muscle cell? What is the neuro side of this neuromuscular junction? So in uh, moving forward with the axon, we talk about the axoplasm or the cytoplasm of the axon and the axolemma, which is going to be the cell membrane of that axon. You have an axon hillock, which is a thick section of cell body attaches to initial segment, and then the initial segment attaches to the axon hillock. Structures of the axon, collaterals, telodendria, and you have axon terminals, which are the tips of the telodendria. This is a very basic idea of what uh, a neuron looks like, or the, the sections of a neuron, the anatomy of a neuron, and this is a more complicated one where we have our dendrites, highly branched dendrites, and this is our our uh, our nucleus, a very large nucleus, and our signals are going to come in from, uh, from these uh, dendrites, and they're going to move down the axon to the axon terminals where it is going to have a further effect and continue to send that message to either another neuron or a gland or a, uh, a muscle. So within this cell body, we have the perikaryon, which is our, our uh, cytoplasm, and we have our mitochondria in there making our ATP, and we have these nasal bodies or these the rough endoplasmic reticulum that is very dense, which is uh, covered in ribosomes and the structure of the neuron goes down to the synapse that's where the neuron communicates with another cell whether it be the cell or the tissue of a gland the muscle or another neuron we have presynaptic cells that we talk about postsynaptic cell and then the synaptic cleft which is uh, really all relative to which neuron you are talking about the synaptic terminal terminal it expanded area of axon of presynaptic neuron and it contains synaptic vesicles which are going to open up and release neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are chemical messengers. Okay, So we talk about uh, typically uh, endocrine secretions or hormones being chemical messengers but neurotransmitters are also uh, chemical messengers and they are released at the presynaptic membrane they affect the receptors of the postsynaptic membrane are broken down by enzymes and the process can start over and over and over again neuromuscular junction we talked about that how the synapse is going to 
to uh, be between the neuron and the muscle, and it's going to cause that change in the muscle. Well, the same thing goes for a neuroglandular junction. There's going to be a synapse between a neuron, and instead of a muscle, it's going to go to a gland and, and cause a change in that gland, have that gland secrete hormones so that we can further uh, communicate with the rest of the body. This just shows you an idea of a, a junction where you have this uh, this terminal right here, and synaptic vesicles can release those neurotransmitters, and this would be our synaptic cleft, and this would be our postsynaptic. So we have our presynaptic, and this is our our axon coming down, and then we have our postsynaptic membrane here, where this would be the next uh, uh, structure. Structural classifications of neurons, you have an axonic neurons found in the brain and the sense organs, bipolar neurons, which are found in special sensory organs for sight, smell, and hearing, unipolar or unipolar neurons found in sensory neurons of the peripheral nervous system. So here we have the axonic, which are going to be in the central nervous system. Here we have the unipolar in the peripheral nervous system, and then we have multipolar, which is common in central nervous system as well, include all skeletal muscle motor neurons. Here you see the anoxonic neurons found in the brain, bipolar, unipolar, and you have multipolar. So it really depends on uh, where the cell body is and how many axons or how many uh, um, branches there really are from that, that cell body. When we talk about just the basic di diagram, we're typically talking about the motor, uh, the multipolar neuron. And then some functional classifications, they're typically going to, or they're always going to be either sensory, motor, or interneurons. They're going to be involving with receiving messages, sending messages, or somewhere in between the messages. And some functions of the sensory neurons, they're going to monitor internal environment and monitor effects of the external environment. This is where we talk about visceral sensory neurons versus somatic sensory neurons. And you have the unipolar uh, neurons where the cell bodies grouped in sensory ganglia processes uh, extend from sensory receptors to the central nervous system. Interoceptors are going to monitor internal systems uh, that we talk about um, where you have the digestive system, the respiratory system, cardiovascular system, urinary system, reproductive system, and then as well as internal senses like pain and pressure and touch and taste. And external senses are exteroceptors. Um, and then you have proprioceptors, which are going to help maintain our body's position. They monitor po the position and the movement of the skeletal muscles and the joints. Then you have your motor neurons. So we have our sensory, and then we also have our motor. Our motor neurons are going to carry instructions from the central nervous system to the peripheral effectors uh, via the efferent fibers. So we have our sensory involved with our afferent, and then we have our motor involved with our efferent. Motor neurons are going to either be somatic nervous system uh, section or, or auto, autonomic or visceral nervous system section. So our somatic is going to be involved with our skeletal muscles and our autonomic or our visceral nervous system is going to be, or our visceral motor neurons is going to be, are going to be involved with our smooth muscle, our cardiac muscle, our glands and our fat tissue, our adipose tissue. Two groups of efferent axons, you have your preganglionic fibers and your postganglionic fibers. Interneurons, uh, most are located in the brain and the spinal cord between sensory and motor neurons. So interneurons, they're the in-between neurons. And they're responsible for distribution of sensory information, coordination of motor activities, and they're also involved in higher functioning such as memory, planning, and learning. So they play a major part in the brain. Going back to talking about neuroglia, so in our central nervous system, we have different types of neuroglia or our supporting cells, uh, epidemal cells. Epidemal cells, they're going to uh, line ventricles of the brain and central canal of the spinal cord, assist in producing, circulating, and monitoring cerebral spinal fluid. They're going to maintain, the, the astrocytes are going to maintain the blood uh, brain barrier 
and you have the oligodendrocytes, which are going to myelinate the CNS axons. So myelin is important on the axons to help wrap, wrap the axons, just like uh, a power cord has that rubber around it so that 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 it stays, uh, the electric uh, continues to move down it and it doesn't go haywire and go elsewhere. So it helps to push that signal along. Um, and then you have microglia, which are going to remove cell debris, waste, kind of the cleanup crew of the neuroglia. Like I said, epidermal cells, cerebrospinal fluid, astrocytes maintain that blood brain barrier, oligodendrocytes important in myelination, making sure that uh, that myelin insulates the axons and helps get that signal down the axon. And then you have oligodendrocytes, which are uh, the, uh, the the nodes and the internodes. Um, and we often call those nodes nodes of Ranvier. So nodes of Ranvier are the gaps between the internodes, the gaps between the, my, the myelin that we see on a neuron, on the axon of a neuron. Myelination, so white matter is going to be the region of the CNS with many myelinated nerves, and the gray matter is the unmyelinated areas of the CNS. So you want to know about gray matter and white matter. White matter is going to be myelinated and gray matter unmyelinated. Microglia, all right, it's the cleanup crew. This shows you a diagram where you have your epidermal cells right here, your microglial cells, your neurons. This is going to be our myelin right here. Any area between the myelin, like back here, this blue area, that is going to be called a node of Ranvier, where there is no myelin in that section. This shows you node right here. Oligodendrocyte, um, unmyelinated axon. This would be myelinated. You have your astrocytes, ganglia. All right, so neuroglia of the peripheral nervous system. We talk about ganglia. It's masses of neuron cell bodies. So this dense area of neuron cell bodies, we call it. We don't call it masses of neuron cell bodies, we call it the ganglia. And it's surrounded by neuroglia, those supporting cells found in the peripheral nervous system. So the neuroglia that we talk about uh, in the peripheral nervous system, you have your satellite cells, they're going to surround the neuron cell bodies in the ganglia, in those dense areas of, ner of neurons. And then you have Schwann cells, which are going to surround all axons of the peripheral nervous system responsible for myelination or covering of the peripheral axons and participates in the repair process after injury. Satellite cells, also called anthocytes, surround the neuroglia and they regulate environment around the neuron. Schwann cells, also called neurolemma cells, they form the myelin sheath or the myelin or the neurolemma around the peripheral nervous system. We need that myelin to help that axon to send that that uh, that message down the axon to the uh, next neuron or the gland or the muscle. One Schwann cell sheaths one segment of an axon. All right, many Schwann cells sheath the entire axon. So we have one Schwann cell in one area, another one in the next area, and they all link up to uh, cover the entire axon. All right, so here you go. You have your spaces here. All right, one. Schwann cell would not cover the entire thing, but if we have many of them, then you'll see that uh, the entire axon will be covered. Ion movements and electrical signals. So when we talk about the uh, the sending of signals, we have to talk about a membrane potential. So every neuron has a membrane potential. It has a charge, whether it be a negative or a positive charge, that is the potential, that membrane potential, um, which is very important, depending on what the membrane potential is, is going to affect if it is able to fire, if it is able to send that signal down the line. You have resting potential, okay, that's the potential of the cell when the cell is resting, when it is not firing, when it is not sending that that uh, that signal down. And then you have a graded potential, which is temporary localized change in that resting potential, which is caused by a stimulus, caused by receiving 
uh, a message from uh, previous. And then you have your action potential. That's an electric impulse produced by a graded potential propagates along the surface of an axon to go to the synapse. All right. We are looking for an action potential in order to send that message down the line to the next neuron, to the gland, to the, the skeletal muscle. You have synaptic activity, which releases neurotransmitters at presynaptic membranes, and then you and then it produces graded potentials in postsynaptic membrane. And then you also have information processing, which is a response or integration of stimuli of postsynaptic cells. Membrane potential, three important concepts that we talk about with the membrane potential. You have extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid or cytosol differ greatly in the composition of these chemicals, of these ions, um, of these atoms, positively or negatively charged atoms. Uh, in When we talk about neurons, um, we're talking about ions that are positive, positively charged. We're talking about sodium ions and potassium ions, where you're going to have uh, sodium ions that we're trying to remove out so that we can cause a, a action potential once again cells have selectively permeable membranes to certain uh, um, ions which plays a vital role in the whole process of an action potential and uh, restarting the whole process over again so um, membrane uh, permeability varies depending on the specific ion you have chemical gradients uh, um, where we talk about uh, if there's more on the outside and less on the inside, or more on the inside, less on the outside. Electrical gradients, which is going to be a difference in the potential in that charge inside or outside of the neuron. Here we see passive chemical gradients. The intercellular concentration of potassium is relatively high. Okay, so inside it's high. So these ions tend to move out of the cell through the potassium leak channels. Similarly, the extracellular concentration of sodium, sodium ions um, is relatively high, so the sodium ions move into the cell through sodium leak channels. Both of these movements are driven by a, the uh, concentration gradient or a chemical gradient. We have sodium-potassium pumps or active pumps that are going to ex uh, exchange this sodium and this potassium and ma maintains the concentration of sodium-potassium ions across the plasma membrane. Passive um, electrical gradients, these uh, potassium ions leave the cytosol more rapidly than sodium enters because the plasma membrane is much more permeable, permeable to the potassium than to the sodium. And then you have resting membrane potential where whenever positive and negative ions are held apart, a potential difference arises. So there's going to be a difference in the charge within the cell based on where the positively charged ions are. If you look at this within the cell, we have these negatively charged ions. So inside the cell tends to be negative at a resting potential. But as ions move in, as there's an influx of positively charged ions, then that negative charge is going to move up and eventually become a positive charge, which is then going to force that electrical signal to move down the axon and send that signal to wherever it has to go. So electrical currents and resistance, electrical currents, um, the, the movement of the charges to eliminate the, the potential difference, and the resistance is the amount of current a membrane restricts. So we have that gradient with the sodium and the potassium ions. Uh, sodium, uh, uh, potassium is going to have a negative uh, 90 millivolts. So sodium is going to be plus 66 millivol millivolts. So we're going to see that there's movement of these ions, which can change the the uh, charge of that that membrane or the, the charge of that that neuron. So potassium ion gradients, a normal resting membrane potential, and electrical gradient opposes the chemical gradient for potassium ions. The net electrochemical gradient tends to force potassium ions out of the cell. So the, the, the potassium ions are forced out of the cell. And we're going to see that um, the outflow of the potassium would continue until the equilibrium potential of the negative 90 millivolts was reached. And then at normal resting poten uh, membrane potential, the chemical and electrical gradients combine to drive sodium ions into the cell. And 
If the plasma membrane were freely permeable to sodium ions, the influx of sodium would continue until the equilibrium potential or plus 66 millivolts was reached. Um, you know, there, that's what creates our difference. So we need these sodium potassium ATPase exchange pumps, all right, powered by ATP. So we need energy. We need that cellular energy, that ATP, in order to get our, our membranes back to where we want them. It's going to care, carry three sodiums out. Remember, because they're going to rush in, so we need that, them to be moved out, and we need two sodiums to be moved in because they are going to rush out. So in order to keep this balance, we need these sodium-potassium ATPase pumps, which is going to help maintain the resting potential of negative 70 millivolts because we want our resting potential to be negative 70 millivolts so that we can create that action potential of plus 30 millivolts in order for that uh, that signal to be sent down the line. So because the plasma membrane is highly permeable, the potassium ions, uh, two potassium ions, the resting potential of approximately negative 70 millivolts is fairly close to negative 90 millivolts. And, with, um, and then the electrochemical gradient for sodium ions is very large, but the membrane's permeability to these ions is very low. So the sodium has only a small effect on the normal resting potential, making it just slightly less negative than the equilibrium potential for potassium. The sodium-potassium exchange point pump ejects the three sodium and for every two potassium ions that brings it into the cell and it serves to stabilize the resting potential when the ratio um, through the um, when the ratio changes because we want to get it back to that three to two at the normal resting potential these passive and active mechanisms are in balance and then we are going to see that uh, as we use passive uh, channels they're always going to be open but we're going to have active channels or gated channels they're going to open and close close in response to stimuli so three states of gated channels are either going to be closed they're going to be open which is activated or they're going to be closed and not capable of opening which is inactivated three classes of gated channels chemically voltage gated and mechanically gated channels so we have our graded potentials that we talked about where it's in a local area. The resting state opening sodium channel produces a graded potential. The resting membrane exposed to the chemical sodium channel channel opens. The sodium ions enter the cell. So there's going to be a rush of sodium in, sodium ions into the cell and the membrane potential rises and then depolarization occurs which means that that signal is now sent down we we moved away from that negative 70 millivolts and we were able to send that message this shows you the resting uh state depolarization is sending is shifting that membrane potential away from that negative 70 millivolts to a more positive number maybe zero millivolts or even trying to get it to plus 30 millivolts Stimulation, so the membrane exposed to the chemical that opens the sodium ion channels. We open that sodium ion channels and that sodium is going to rush in. There's going to be an influx. So now this here, we, they show you that you have negative 65 millivolts. Well, once we have that influx of positive sodium ions, we're now going to move towards a more positive number. And then we're going to create that graded potential, which is going to spread the sodium ions inside the plasma membrane, produce a local current that depolarizes adjacent portions of the plasma membrane. All right, so we're moving away from that negative. And then eventually we are going to repolarize. So when the stimulus is removed, the membrane potential returns back to normal, returns back to that negative 70 millivolts. And then hyperpolarization we talk about, it's the increased uh, increasing the negativity of the rest, resting potential results of, of, of opening a potassium ch channel, opposite effect of opening a sodium channel. So if we are continuing to let that, that, uh, that potassium move, then we're going to see that those negative proteins in the in the in the cell are going to have a greater effect and it's going to be become even more negative than our negative 70 millivolts and this just kind of shows you the the whole idea of depolarizing all right we have to get over that hump in order to send that message once that that message is sent then we go back to our resting membrane potential um, as far as talking about hyperpolarization we're getting further away from being able to depolarize so don't worry so much about this, but 
you understand that we are depolarizing up until here, we are saying that message and then we are repolarizing so that if we get another stimulus, we can then uh, send that message once again. So keep these things in mind as we move forward. We're going to start talking more about the structures and uh, the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system and the different parts of the brain and the spinal cord and the nerves that are involved with that. For now, you need to understand uh, that the functional unit of the nervous system is the neuron and everything is built up of the neuron and these the neuroglia that are going to support these neurons.